Welcome to Non-Consensus Investing. I'm Ram Alawalia, your host and CIO at Lumida Wealth, where we specialize in the craft of alternative investments. At Lumida, we help guide clients through the intricacies of managing substantial wealth so they don't have to shoulder the burden alone. Through this podcast, we draw back the curtain to reveal the strategies employed by the best in the business for their high net worth clients so that you too can invest beyond the ordinary. All right, and we're live. I'm pleased to be joined by my friend Rohit Mittal, who is an exited founder, went through the Y Combinator program, built and sold a fintech lender financing immigrants, which is an interesting topic we want to unpack today. I think immigration is influencing the economy in multiple ways. Uh, and Rohit's also a global citizen. He was born in India, lived in Berlin, lived in London, lived in SF, and then New York. And so he has very unique cultural perspectives at large and also perspectives on the United States and entrepreneurship and why things come together in the United States. Uh, you know, prior to founding uh, his startup, he has extensive experience in credit risk analytics and data science uh, as well. And he's got a master's in operations research at my alma mater. Uh, Columbia. So welcome, Rohit. Good to see you. How are I'm you? I'm doing well. Thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, I actually I lived in Germany in Dusseldorf. Uh, I wish I lived in Berlin. And oh, is it Dusseldorf? Okay, thank you for the correction. Yeah, man. and and it wasn't as as cosmopolitan as as Berlin, but it was one of it's one of the world's best cities to live in, like in terms of like uh, quality, safety, you know, all of those things. So so it was it was pretty good. Okay, well. We're going to talk about a few topics today. One is the truth about venture investing, mm -hmm. because you've looked behind the veil and you've met the Wizards of Oz. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of undress that for the audience. And I believe the observations you have to share, some I share and, and others, including VC share. We'll talk about trends as well, Cedar funds. We'll also share some perspective on the 2021 mania mm -hmm. and where we are then, where we are now, and some of the nonsense that happened. But let's start off with venture investing. So what is, what's the truth about venture investing? You know, I think a lot of people like me, uh, especially folks who, are, who have been outside the Bay, we only see what's put in front of us. And somehow I, I believe that many ideas are venture scale businesses or venture businesses, and they can raise venture capital and, and uh, generate big, big exits. I've found that there are, I found that there are very few ideas that actually fall into that bucket. And I've kind of, my, my pendulum has swung on the other side in the sense that uh, uh, very, very few ideas actually fit the box of a business that can actually become venture scale within three to five years or five to seven years of being funded by uh, these VCs. For most of these businesses, you cannot compress. Uh, and do you mean that from an ex-ante or an ex-post perspective? Meaning ex-ante, what you're saying is that these are businesses that going into it, we know that the TAM or the ability to scale isn't there. Or do you mean that after the fact, which of course, you know, most startups fail. We know they can't capture that. Opportunity. I think ex ante, especially in the last few years, uh, people just wanted to believe that many of these businesses can scale. And starting 2023 and 2024, they are seeing that exposed that many of these businesses couldn't. It wasn't, we just changed the definition of what can become a venture scale business. And now that definition is kind of going back to what it was previously, like pure software or majority software, very high gross margins, and then where you can spend money to actually scale the company. Uh, so that sounds like a self-deception then, right? So there's a belief that these were scalable, venture-backable businesses, then they weren't. And you know, and one of the factors was valuation, yeah. right? In 2021, what were the valuations we saw out there? And you're also an angel investor yeah. too. So you've seen this in a couple different ways. Yeah. Um, uh, so our business was uh, thankfully never valued that highly because we were a lending business and, and most of our revenue was from... Um, interest revenue and VCs at that time had decided that, you know, lending businesses are not 500x ARR businesses. So, uh, so we never, we never got the, the highest of the valuations, uh, but a lot of other businesses in unproven categories uh, got, got 
got very high valuations. Now, when I, as, as I'm angel investing in some of these companies, I'm kind of seeing, I invest because of the founders, because I'm the, just that early stage. And because I know the people, I don't even know what the business is eventually going to do or how eventually they're going to make money. It's just very broad at the time I'm making that investment. And then some of these companies I see, like I invested, um, in like let's say day zero i invested in the company and day 15 they they are valued at 50 million and they have wait so day zero, you invested at what value i invested it on maybe 10 million something like that just and that was like a seed or seed first money in first, uh, second check-in third check-in like right out of yc or during yc or something like that so mainly i like my network is y combinator because we went through uh yc in winter 16 and i'm as i'm helping some of the yc founders i decided to just invest in some of these companies and they're like, yeah, no, we are starting a friends and family round. And, you know, if, if you would like to invest, we'll whatever amount you want to invest, we'll we are happy to take it. And valuation for friends and family is 10 million or 15 million. So we got. It. Yeah. So I invested in that. And then one week or two weeks later, they, they I think, five X uh, in their seed round. And I, <laughs> I don't know Why what changed. Like a VT showed up and say, look, I'm going to give you 50 million valuation. Yeah. Few weeks later, yeah. and then what happened after that? Uh, they they are just they just raised a lot of money, and they're continuing to build the business. Um, but okay. I think uh, the business has somewhat caught up to these these valuations. But I still think like there's a lot still lot left to be desired, given where the businesses are uh, and where the valuations are. They're still like you know twenty, thirty, forty x ARR valuations. Well, you know, I don't know that I've heard many entrepreneurs say. And I'm glad we didn't get an excessive valuation, like you yeah. said. Yeah, yeah. Because the VCs had wisened up around the valuations of fintech lending. Most entrepreneurs are saying, hey, let me max out on the valuation yeah. because they're accomplishment oriented and they measure that as a mark of success mm -hmm. as opposed to growing profits. Right. Because they read the headlines around them. <laughs> and if they're not keeping up with the Joneses, their peer group right. in SF, then they feel like their idea lacks validation. I think it is, I was in, in that category also, uh, but because I, it, I think it's just my natural inclination that I've always been like outcome oriented then. And I always thought like, if I raise at, you know, 50 X ARR, like how am I going to get an exit in the company that's valuable to my investors and to ourselves also uh going walk through that why is that why does the math of raising at a 50x arr which is a high valuation hurt the outcome when you might look at that as a marker that you're on the path if my so valuations always are always ahead of value created by the business and at least that's that's what I believe in, in um, especially in the early stages if the valuations are too far ahead of the value and the value never catches up. The, the fall down is super uh, demotivating for the founders, for the investors, for the team and uh, broadly for the, the ecosystem. If like some, someone, something's valued, like I saw a company today, it, the news came out in information security startup valued at 8 billion is being sold at 150 million. And I just can't, Im oh, wow. yeah, I can't imagine like how demotivating it, it is for the employees who bought into the vision of a company and they're taking so much risk. I think it, it, it is also like not fair to the, to the employees who are taking a very high risk joining. Well, their options are worthless and what happens you know, maybe explain for our audience what happens when you raise at that high valuation and you sell for less money that you took in yeah who gets paid out first sure so so we we actually had the you know the longest stack on top of us as we sold the company so the first all the debt investors get paid so if the company took any type of uh loan or corporate debt or uh asset backed debt or whatever like they get paid first then you have to make sure that all the employees, at least payroll and things like those, like vendor bills are paid. Then preferred investors get paid. So whenever someone raises money, all the investors get preferred stock, all the founders and the employees have common stock and options. 
And they're last in they're line. They're last in line. So, so employees are even after the founders in, in many cases. So if between debt and bills and preferred investors, all if all the money goes there, you don't make anything. So the employees don't have restricted stock. Mm-hmm. They have options, mm-hmm. which have a strike price. And another way to simplify is like last money in gets paid out first because of, you know, VCs call it lick pref Mm -hmm. or it's liquidation Mm -hmm. preference. It's a structure in the, you call it the stack, the capital stack that protects new money. And it's a funny dynamic because that structure also makes it easier to accept new money because new money can say, hey, look, if we're paying too much for this, we've got preference. We're first money out. We'll get put back to par. We will get our funds back. And that story keeps going for the next investor and the next investor. So that startup you mentioned, $8 billion valuation sold for $150 million. I don't know how, how much money they took in. That last investor may have done okay. Probably not because they probably raised multiples of $150 million. Right. But they got a couple of cents on the dollar back. And now they have to do this painful recapitalization, mm-hmm. depending on what happened with the business, uh, which is something that private equity firms do all the time. VCs don't like doing that. By that point, the VCs checked off the board. Right. They're not there. Yeah. They're working on the next team, the next startup. So, um, you know, what were the valuation multiples that we saw in 2021? Uh, I think average like 50, 100x ARR for SaaS companies growing at 100% year over year. What were the, what were like the nonsense thing? What was the zeitgeist? Bring us back to that moment in time. I'm trying to remember. It feels like ages ago now. Um, remember Bird? Yeah, Bird was like insane. Yeah, the two billion valuation, and I think after it spagged, it's worth like twenty five million. And like someone speaking of Bird, all birds. Yeah. Remember all yeah. birds, the DTC brand. Mm-hmm. I mean, all these consumer goods were flying off the shelf because people were at home, right? And the public market Zoom stock took off. Right. Allbirds is now worth less than $100 million. Yeah. Trazio, I think, filed for bankruptcy. They, they raised, I don't know, insane amounts of money at multiple billions of dollars of valuation to roll up Amazon stores. Right, right. So that was also another hot trend, yeah. right? You had the roll up craze. It was like, hey, uh, I've got private equity money. Mm-hmm. Could be a family office, could be, but in general, it's classic private equity. It's like, hey, let's go find these online retailers. that got stores on Amazon and roll them up and then plug and play into our marketing team and our analytics team to level up their yes. sales growth yeah. and optimize our fulfillment. And that was another hot yep. trend, which was actually zeitgeist of just COVID, yeah. turns yeah. out. Yeah, it, it it just doesn't didn't make sense. Like there was nothing software about that business, and it still got like software valuations. And some of these trends, like Hopin, is another example in the same category as Zoom. And Zoom still survives as a great business. Lots of cash flow. Zoom throws off a shit ton of cash flow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a real business, but yeah, it did cu- get caught up in the valuation. Yeah, uh, I think it IPO'd at some some tens of billions of valuation. Quickly became a seventy billion, hundred billion dollar company. And on the backs of that, Hopin became like a, a seven billion dollar company, raised a billion dollars recently. Saw they even returned six hundred million to investors. So, the VCs that assign these valuations, like who are these VCs? The VC, the, yeah, they're they're everywhere. And then I think the you know so VC game is a power law all the way through. So if you look at companies, it's a power law. Like few companies will become very big and, and a lot of them uh, won't. And then you come to the VC forums, there are like few VC forums that that I call are the kingmaker. So if they invest in your round, you you can like do whatever the hell you want. Like if A16Z, Founders One, Sequoia, like many of these tier one benchmark, benchmark uh, they're, they're like 15. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Kleiner, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Kleiner now uh, has become like all these are like tier one VCs, yeah. and if any of them are investing in in your round or leading your round, the the founders basically the, the rest of the industry will is will write a blank check to them. And I have like heard secondhand stories of like if Sequoia is leading a round, like everyone's like we'll just write whatever we'll we'll yeah. put whatever money you want. Everyone wants to be the the first second money in. 
So they after Sequoia Invest, they want to be the first money. Or after Tier and, 1 VC Invest, they want to be the first money. And they'll, so they'll write the check after Sequoia, but in a separate round at a higher price. They could. Like I've seen like some of these uh, investors will write uh, uh, an uncapped, uncapped note. So they'll just add okay. uncapped valuations so when it con- when the next round is raised, that's when it's going to convert. And they're taking all the risks today of giving the money of company executing, but they are they are just hoping, I, I'm assuming they're hoping that the next round, uh, the, they'll just uh, justify the valuation. They were literally giving like a 0% interest-free loan yep. unless I had a participating coupon prefer that. I'd yeah, but that's the, that's not the common thing here in the Bay Area. It's all safes, it's all uncapped notes, it's all, there is, there is the only conversion that happens is when there is a price round. And if it doesn't happen, if the company shuts down, whatever, there is no first right to that safe. What about founders taking chips off the table during this dynamic? I mean, that's uh, that's the thing that justify. That's one of the reasons founders also want very high valuations, because if I, it's a very high valuation, then I can raise more money even though my company may not need that kind of money. So if I'm raising, let's say 25 million at a 250 million valuation, my company only needs 20 million. I'll take founders and in some cases, the teams will take some chips off the table. And um, there was this uh, whole uh, mania where founders were taking uh, chips off the table at seed round, like in their first round. And uh, many obviously did at Series A and Series B, depending on how long they've been working at the company. In some cases, founders would raise round and quick successions, primarily for that reason, because they can take some chips off the table and the company is going to kind of figure things out later. You you had this great line earlier. You said sometimes value gets ahead of valuation. Valuation gets ahead of value. Yes. Right. Thank you. Valuation gets ahead of value. And literally at the seed round, you're getting a 10 million plus valuation. Mm-hmm. Things got crazier then to your earlier point. And there's maybe nothing mm-hmm. there. Maybe a couple slides and a couple founders. Right. Like right. that, and but you're getting this value. And they're taking money off the table. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And so uh, yeah, and that's it it wasn't as common, but it was uh happening in 2021. Time of the times. Yes. That was some of the bananas that we saw. Mm-hmm. Nice. And look, there are zombie companies, mm-hmm. I call them now, that raised a boatload of mm-hmm. money, including Canada, by mm-hmm. the way. They raised a boatload of money at an absurd valuation, and they have a ton of cash. Mm-hmm. And some of them are actually prudently managed, like cut costs. Mm-hmm. They will never go away. They will never get a public markets exit. Mm-hmm. They will never get acquired. And they're just out there doing their thing. Who knows how they're marked right. by the VCs, meaning in their investor presentation to their LPs, who knows what they're saying the return on that investment is going to be. And there's never going to be a mark because they're never going to raise money. Mm-hmm. So they can put a finger in the air and say, well, we think it's what the last price was that markets are coming yep. back. I see, I call these companies like also like the, the founders are in VC welfare in a way. It's just, <laughs> Tell me more about this VC welfare. It's, it's just like, I, I talked to a few founders that raised like 20, 30, 40 million dollars in 2021, 2022, and they were burning, let's say a million dollars a month or something like that. And the, the revenue wasn't growing as fast and uh, they were not able to like generate enough um value for their customers so what they decided is like they are not going to be able to raise the next round so they they cut their team to the bone so it's like maybe they were 50 people now they are like 10 people barely like the team that's required to keep the product going skeleton crew yeah skeleton crew for their existing customers and whatever organic growth comes uh they'll they'll take that and then they're building like a little bit of product uh, along the way And now they have, uh, I'm just taking an example, now they have, let's say, $20 million in the bank. And there are 10 people burning $2 million a year. They have 10 years of runway. And 
the companies <laughs> yeah, like so like the, the the thing at this point is like do you want to stay on vc welfare and some founders do because they're like at least it's a job the job market is tough so it's a job they are getting paid as founders they they can decide the direction of the company but the vcs need to say is it do i want to be invested in this company for the long run or do i think that the company is not going to go anywhere should i exit the company sell it to someone for whatever amount and take all the cash back so i can deploy it somewhere else right take your lumps sell it at a discount that's the right move that they should be doing the opportunity uh, cost of money is too high for, for exactly. them and if you're a founder I don't believe it does make sense because the point of starting a company is to get uh, an outcome with long-term capital gains that you're not going to get through W-2 income. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can work for yourself, but founders work harder than anyone else. Mm -hmm. So be careful what you wish yeah. for. Uh, you know, if you're the founder, you're, you're going to have to address everything from customer complaints to closing the sale and everything between to hiring and <laughs> you name it. There's a lot to do. Right. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of these companies are still around uh, in fintech and in, in crypto in in venture. Uh, I spoke with uh, my friend uh, Stephanie Chu at uh, Venture Fund in New York. Mm -hmm. He said that the valuations had reset, but now they're back. Mm -hmm. They're coming back, very elevated. And Y Combinator uh, batches are seeing high valuations once again, mm -hmm. like twenty million dollar plus kind of valuation, not across the board, but often enough. Uh, I think Y Combinator batches always see higher valuations than the market because of the historical right. success, because of just like it's a, again, as I said, it's a power law and people expect or VCs and uh, other, uh, other folks investing expect that the, the YC is on the farther end or the, the, they are ahead of the curve in, in that sense. Well, YC is in a great position. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your experience at YC. First off, on the financial terms and what they taught you. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the one or two takeaways that you learned that helped you drive success? Sure. Uh, so uh, we went when we went through YC, it was a standard deal, 7% for, I think, 150K. At that time, they had done 150K. Can't remember exactly. So 7% of the company they got for $150,000 of capital. And what's the implied valuation? About 1.7 million. Okay, so that's like a Shark Tank. That Shark Tank deals actually have revenue. Yeah. So Shark Tank deals are in a better position than Y Combinator, mm -hmm. and they get the free advertising. So you can't beat Shark Tank. But Y Combinator is in a pretty good spot. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, implied valuation 1.7 million. The funny thing is we actually had revenue because we had done loans with our own money by that time, and we were earning interest on that. Um, so we went through YC uh, and we, because we were immigrants on visas, it was incredibly difficult for us to actually run the company or build a company without YC's help, support, uh, that validation, uh, so to speak. So nonetheless, uh, I, I still to this day believe our company would not exist without YC. They were super valuable for us. And the the learnings that i got i think i was on a you know being in the top tier set of founders and and mentors uh taught us a lot the, if i were to pick like one or two things it's just the sense of urgency and the speed of iteration do these have a sense of urgency iterate as fast as you can by spending as less money as you can and that's that's the environment you are in so you don't even realize how fast you are executing on an absolute basis, because on a relative basis, you see like other companies executing faster than you or your friends in the batch executing as, as fast as you. And, and that kind of is like, like a it. totally different environment. And the common theme there is the word speed. Mm -hmm. Urgency means speed. Iterate fast means speed. And also learning. I had a Frank Rotman, my friend, who's a GP mm -hmm. at QED. Uh, and uh, Frank was on one of the earlier pods. He had a master class. And the analogy he has is that you're playing a card game, mm -hmm. let's say like poker, and you're taking a draw of a card and you're paying to learn, to, you're paying to flip the next card. Right. And the card's going to either have good evidence or bad evidence. 
good evidence, evaluation should go up. Bad evidence, you have to make a decision. Do I pay more mm -hmm. to learn more? So it's really the process of discovery right. that a student is going, going through. So it's important to iterate quickly, launch quickly, uh, feel ashamed about what you launch, right. I think is one of the terms that Y Combinator used. Who, who interviewed you at, at YC? Uh, we, we actually had two interviews. So YC generally does one interview. We had two. So total seven or eight people interviewed me. And I remember like five or six of them. So Paul Bukhite, who's the creator of Gmail, John Levy, who's YC's general counsel. Uh, there were two more people with them in the first group uh, who interviewed us. And it's like it's like a rapid fire Thing. So they ask one question after the other, even if I have not finished answering or if they feel like they got the answer. Yeah. yeah so, so it's, it's, it's super fast. So that's first 10 minute interview. Then the second 10 minute interview, we had, uh, Jessica Livingston, who's also the co-founder of YC, Aaron Harris, uh, Dalton Caldwell, and one more person. Uh, so. So you had two separate 10 minute interviews mm -hmm. and they were group interviews. Mm -hmm. And. You know, what I've read about YC is they're underwriting the founder, which makes all the sense in the world because you're going to learn, you're going to discover, you're going to have to pivot. Uh, and what they're trying to find is like, hey, does this person have the potential to be the next Mark Zuckerberg in terms of like disposition, sure. grit, mentality? Uh, what do you think that they were trying to get at with those interviews? Like what qualities were they trying to uncover or measure? I think they just want to understand uh, founders tenacity and the mindset of execution and how real the founders are. Uh, it's, it, it's very obvious or it's very uh, counterintuitive, but a 10 minute rapid fire interview gives you a lot more insight into the founder than a very long one hour conversation. And because what they're trying to understand is how well does this person know what they are currently building? Yeah. So they're testing for subject matter, not just tenacity. Yeah. But how do they test on subject matter if they themselves don't come from the industry? I think so. I think so. All YC partners review applications before they are interviewed. So the process is you do a written application, you get selected for an interview. And then uh, the 10 minute interview happens. So before the interview, all the partners who are interviewing you have read your application. So even if they don't have the, the expertise, they, they are uh, very insightful and sharp at figuring, at asking the right questions. So in our case, uh, I still remember this one particular question where they're talking about competitors and who still is going to compete with and who's what's the largest company that still can hope to become, like what's the analogy? And I said Lending Club at the time. It had IPO'd at, at 10 billion valuation or something like that. And uh, it was like, okay, Lending Club, like what's the valuation of the company? And I said like X is the valuation, Y is the stock price, so on and so forth. And he opened the, Paul Lukite, I still remember, opened the computer and checked Lending Club's valuation and the stock price. And I was within 2 per, two or 3% of what it was at that day. Now, I could not- I check you on the spot. Exactly. Like, and, and I could not have prepared for that question. Like, I, would, I wouldn't, because like, it was nowhere mentioned in, in our application or anywhere else. And I did not expect them to ask me about Lending Club's stock price, so to speak. Uh, it reminds me, by the way, of one of my first interviews on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. They gave me three numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm like numbers now. And if you and the audience get this right, write it in the chat. So $80, 3.6% and 60,000. What's, I'm going to quiz you right here. <laughs> <What are those? laughs> this is round two. Why Combinator? <laughs> Make your break. $80, 3.6% uh, and 60,000. Three points in, what year was that? Today. Oh, today. Unemployment rate is 3.6%, I'm assuming. 60,000, maybe average US household income, or it's like 62,000. Um, $80 is price of oil. Nailed it. Bingo. Oh, wow. Okay. So the other ones were uh, Bitcoin and the 10 year rate. Okay. But that's okay. The only hint there would be Wall Street, really, yeah. like Wall Street Journal. Yeah. But I like that. They're, they're looking for subject matter. It's a rapid fire. They're looking for the soft underbelly. They know where to focus because they know businesses come down to, can you acquire, retain customers, differentiate your value proposition? 
grow and have a good business model. Right. And they've seen a lot of these and they've got, they're interviewing hundreds of people so they can comp, right? All that soft intuition comes into play right. around what people respond. Now, you did that interview solo or did you have a co-founder join you in I that? I had my co-founder CTO join me in that. And we had prepared like crazy for that interview. Uh, like answers wow. in that what, 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 what do you do to prepare there? Like, yeah, so uh, we write all the possible questions that Y Combinator can ask us. We write answers, uh, airtight answers to those questions. As in, if I give you an answer, it should it should answer the question and it should not result in another question uh, kind of thing. And it has to be done within 15 to 30 seconds. It's concise. You got to be concise, right. precise, on target. Mm -hmm. And answer at the appropriate level, not too much, not too little. Yes. Uh, within 30 seconds, because they, they'll just cut you off after 30 seconds. They have 10 minutes, mind you. Like if you do 10 minute interview, 30 second question answer each, that's still like a lot of questions they can get through. Right. So their goal at that valuation is to kind of remove duds, mm -hmm. uh, number one, right? They want to avoid false positives. Uh, they want to do a lot of checks though, I would say at that valuation, especially if you have traction. On the other hand, the selectivity rate for Y Combinator is very low. Yeah, it's, it's I don't know what it's now, but it's about one, it was 1 1.2 or 1.5%. More competitive than Harvard. Um, yeah, yeah. That's actually goes into like for, for people like me who are immigrants who are applying for O1 extraordinary ability and all these, these different types of visas, you're like, Y Combinator is more selective than Harvard. So you were born in mm -hmm. India, you went to Dusseldorf, then London. Mm -hmm. You, you seem like a very impatient kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, so how did you apply to YC? You weren't a US citizen. Then. I wasn't, no. No, you are now, mm -hmm. but then you were not. Okay. Yes. So yeah. what was your visa status when you applied? I was on an H-1B visa. I used to work at a company called Pop Sugar here in the Bay Area. And so and do you want to define an H-1B for the audience? So H-1B is an employer-sponsored visa for folks who are high, have higher education and they can work for that employer for a certain period of time. An H-1B visa is six years maximum given at maximum three years at a time that is tied to the employer. So you have to have an employee sponsoring you. That's the key thing. So how did you apply to Y Combinator if your employer is a sponsor and you want to start a company that doesn't exist and by definition, they can't sponsor you? Yeah. How does that work? Yeah. So I'm not a legal person here, but here's what I did. And, and I always share these stories uh, with the dis disclaimer uh, that do not try this at home, as in like, talk to your lawyer, figure out like, what's the, what's the nice thing for you. <laughs> um, but uh, so... Uh, even if you are on H-1B, you can actually own stock in companies. So like I can invest in public markets, I can invest in private companies, so on and so forth. I cannot be paid uh, as if I'm working at a full-time job or in any consultative and employment capacity in, in these types of uh, investments. So for example, I can buy Microsoft shares. It's still fine, even though I may earn dividends and, and stuff like that, even though uh, I'm fully employed by someone else. Now, I, I had registered the company uh, so I can register a company on H-1B. I cannot get paid for that company. So we had registered the by the company that you registered. I'm sorry, say that again. You cannot get paid by the company that you formed. Yeah, you cannot. You, that company has to really sponsor you. Got it. So when you created a startup, so you're applying to Y Combinator, did you have a company formed? Yes, I had a company formed at the time. I had my co-founder and I, we were also roommates at Columbia. Uh, and we had the company formed, we had certain things going, but we were not getting paid by the company at all. So did you lose your H-1B because you're no longer going to be employed by yeah. your prior sponsor? Yeah, again, like it, it was a super risky move. In in hindsight, it worked out, so so it's fine. But at the time, so we applied to YC. We were still working full time in our in our respective jobs, and you know, doing these at side projects and whatnot. And apply to YC. YC doesn't ask about my visa status. Some other accelerators did, and they were like, you know, Uber. I'm sorry. Uber doesn't ask either. I'm pretty sure. I'm sorry. Say that again. Like Uber, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I'm pretty sure they're not asking either. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so they didn't ask and, and they said, we, we'd be happy to take you. That's like a, a, a story by itself, but we, uh, we got the acceptance and now we have to figure out how are we going to stay in the country? So we got the acceptance in November 
You have funds in the bank. Now you're leaving your employer. Mm -hmm. You're committed to Y Combinator to start this company. Mm -hmm. You're going to lose your visa by definition. I did. Yeah. So I I had to give up my H1B because YC requires you to work full time on your startup when you join. And did you disclose that risk to YC? Yeah. YC is like, just go figure it out. They just said, figure it out. You're an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs are solving problems. Which is a good idea. Yeah. Figure it out. Yeah. So, so, and we did. Funnily enough, um, which it's more common now, but back in 2016, like there were, we didn't know about this visa at the time called O1 visa, which is quote unquote alien of extraordinary ability, uh, which is meant for like scientists, like uh, movie stars, musicians, artists, uh, so on and so forth. So if you want to be in the US, but you have achieved something great, the US wants to have you here. And it's still employer sponsored visa, but it doesn't have a lot of restrictions that H-1B has. So for H-1B, you need to have like enough money in the account, your company needs to be of enough size, so on and so forth. Like I cannot start a company, put a million dollars in there and just start hiding H-1B folks, right? So uh, so we applied for O-1 and luckily enough, I, we had 60 days to figure it out. And luckily enough, we got the O-1 within a few days of application and it was long you know, uh, a very uncertain, long 60 days. Uh, but I think we got it in like total between application and approval within 35 days. And then we could, sponsored by Stilt, which was our company. So now we could continue to work for our company, pay ourselves very little. And yeah, and then we like, we'll figure it out. We'll figure out the rest later. Wow, wow that's incredible. A lot of courage there. Uh, you jump from one vine to another vine and you, you made it work. You also sold your company yes. uh, to JG Wentworth. Mm-hmm. So anyone in structured finance, structured credit knows that business because right. they're the leader in structured settlements, right? You win a lottery ticket. They know who you are. They know how to call you up. They have good lead gen targeting. And they'll say, look, if you're earning $80 million in the next 30 years, we'll give you one lump sum payment up front. Mm-hmm. And they do the math to figure out a present value where they collect that spread. Right. That's essentially JG. It's a cash cow business. Right. It's a Buffett business, not owned by Buffett. I mean, it has the properties of a moat, mm-hmm. only getting down. They know what they're doing really well. Um, throws off a ton of cash. Mm-hmm. Probably declining. It's an old business. Uh, yep. So any you know tips or advice for like the exit process? Um, uh, the, the way I, I tell founders is like, if equity raise was X difficult, debt raise is three X difficult acquisition process is 10 X difficult. So, Ooh, you know, like the, the fundraise is, is like VC fundraise is a process and it's a standard process. You kind of like prepare your deck, answer a few questions like YC in quote unquote, we raise some money within just 10 to 10 minute interviews. Acquisition process is a long slog. It takes anywhere from like six months to even 12 months to get acquired. And there are a lot of hoops to jump and any one decision maker can change their mind at any time. So to build, to really get acquired, you have to think 12 months in advance. So if your startup is running out of money in three months, uh, very like you can't get acquired. I don't know if there's a Hail Mary pass, something like that. Someone needs you and you, you get acquired, but otherwise you need six to nine, minimum nine months of runway uh, because there's a whole process. And then you need to make sure you have your ducks in a row. You need to find the right person who's going to acquire you. And then they're they're going to diligence the shit out of your company. Right. Uh, Yeah, it's a great point. I'd say the key also is not just knowing who the acquirer or the acquirer set is, but having competition mm -hmm. among acquirers for your own psychology and to get a good value for your shareholders. And then at each acquirer, you need a champion. Mm-hmm. And that champion's in the line of business. Mm-hmm. It's not in the m a or corp dev team. Mm-hmm. They're just facilitators mm-hmm. because by and large, they're not gonna own the p and Like corporates have gotten a lot smarter about all this stuff. The line of business is gonna wear the acquisition in their profit and loss statement. Mm-hmm. So it's coming out of their budget. Right. And so to help that, you have to have those relationships well in advance. And the first time you meet that line of business champion, it can't be like, hey, look, I want to sell my right. company in a year. Yeah. You have to have a relationship before the relationship. 
And it's better to be bought than sold. That's another classic expression. If you get bought, you get a good price. Yeah. If you're getting sold, you get a bad price. Yes. So founders have to be great. Storytellers, great salespeople. I mean, it's a process by itself. I mean, how much time are you spending on the M&A and who's running the ship while you're doing that? So uh, it took us a total from conversations to close about nine months. And conversations are like, no one works on your timeline. Like people are on vacation and they are just like, the lawyers are not there or some, something's always happening. That company also has, it, the acquisition is a ta in, in, uh, task that people have to do in addition to their jobs, right? Like, so if you don't have a champion, then like, no, it's no one's responsibility and people are just like moving it very slowly. So in our case, it took six to nine months. And then uh, I was the one leading the acquisition. Thankfully, my co-founder and I have such a great equation that if even if I'm not in the business, he can run the company without me. He is the CTO. He can be the CEO. He can do operations. He can do sales or whatever. So, so we both build the business together. He was running most of the show. I was working on all the diligence all this while without telling the team that this process is going on because it just distracts the company from executing on the core yeah. task. Including execution of revenue growth, yep. which is one of the drivers of evaluation metrics. Yeah. And as you are going through the acquisition process, if something goes awry in your business, the acquirer will be like, wait, wait, wait. Like we thought like your company is- The monitor. Yeah. yeah. You have the data yeah. and they have your forecast from nine months ago. Right. Yeah. So, so it just like, it all becomes very challenging. That's why I say acquisition is 10 X difficult. You can all, depending on the size of the company, you can always hire investment bankers and stuff, but know that it's going to take up majority of the time. Did you retain a banker? Or uh, no? no, we didn't. So I don't think you need to, I don't think most need to, although it's helpful to get guidance and counseling from someone that's done the M and a process right. multiple times. And that could be a former investment banker. It could be a former operator. It could be a seasoned VC. Mm -hmm. It could be someone that's bought companies, but that guidance and coaching when you negotiate a term sheet right. is crucial. Yeah. In, in acquisitions, like what always weighed on my mind is that one wrong statement from me to any key decision maker in the process can actually kill the deal sometimes. Well, the other part of it is <clears throat> it's the lack of urgency to your point, right? Startups on urgency and you're trying to get a deal done to de-risk. Right. How do you push your counterparty? You're like, hey guys, let's go a little faster. Right. You don't want them to say, you know, Rohit's a little pushy. <laughs> I don't think he's a good cultural fit here. Yeah. How do you divide the valuation by 10? Right. Right? right, exactly. It's one of the things you're going, I know this guy went through the similar process as you. I'm like, all right, I need to get this thing moving a little bit faster here. Yeah. We're spending more and more money. Yeah. And I'd say the other part is the trust in the counterparty is crucial. No amount of legal contracting can de-risk trust. Right. So, you know, briefly, we had a material adverse event clause. What that means is like the world goes to hell in a handbasket, the acquirer can pull out of your deal. Right. And, you know, my business is bought by Cross River. COVID started. Mm -hmm. during that. Right. <laughs> they, they, did, they did not exercise that to their credit. Right and to their integrity and honor, and they could have. No one knew what COVID was gonna look like. Right. No one knew right. $2 trillion in stimulus funding was gonna drop them to the sky. Right. And the right. lender was gonna ramp up anyway. For six months, it was, we're looking at Armageddon right. and defaults yeah. gonna go up. So, you know, you can't, you can't contract away trust. You need good counterparties. It's uh, so, so important and it's not, it, Acquisition doesn't end after the company gets acquired. There are always earnouts and bonuses and team retention and like execution beyond the acquisition price. Like no buyer pays the full price on close and they always have some quote unquote golden handcuffs. In many cases, uh, there's also the saying that earnouts are never fully earned. And earnouts are <laughs> by and large. Uh, and, and, your hand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and many times buyers, you know, like can also act out of bad faith. It's like the management changes or management changed their mind about the company. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's super like I think from the outside, it seems all rosy and, you know, 
someone sold the company and that's the end of it. The same way, like building a company is not all rosy, you're not 100x valuation all the way through. It's after ac- the acquisition process and post acquisition, it's not all rosy. There, there's a tough road ahead yeah. until everything is like finally closed. Totally fair. The person in the seat matters. It's not this abstract corporate entity with its own purpose. Like the, the difference between Steve Ballmer and Satya Nadella is major. Like the reason why inflection was internalized because Satya is sponsoring that at that level of deal size and deal right. dollar right. volume. Yeah. He's got to be behind that. He's got to own that. Uh, so yeah, no, I agree. Uh, it comes down to people ultimately to get a transaction done and multiple people. Right stakeholders. Uh, Fascinating. So let's talk about the cultural differences that you've seen. Mm -hmm. When we had dinner in the cosmopolitan melting pot called Brooklyn, Mm -hmm. not long ago, you said SF has monoculture. Mm -hmm. I I love ragging on West Coast. (laughs) I was there with my friends too, but uh, I mean it, I mean it in good, uh, good fun. Yeah. So, um, SF has monoculture. In some ways, it's good. In some ways, it's bad. Uh, The good is like the monoculture is a driven by a few, I'd say, a handful of people and VC firms. Um, It's like, well, what is it? What is the monoculture? Monoculture is like everyone's just talking about the same thing, working on the same thing. Uh, have no diversity of thought or limited. Like Tradfi bro, have you seen that meme of Tradfi bro where he's got the vest? And the coffee. Oh yeah, yes. And it's like you can invest in treasury bonds and the S and P five hundred. Or... No, I I think I've so, seen a different one. Like there are so many memes on like Chad Fibro yeah. and in jacket. So monoculture is everyone's working on the same like themes, the same investment concepts. Yes. So monoculture is people working on the same um, same trend, sometimes called a fad. And okay, and it's driven by a few people or a few like. You know, as a as like a 3D printing, climate change was one, birds was another, right? DTC right. was another one. Now it's AI, now it's AI. Yeah. Web three. These are all trends. These are all trends. And, and trends, also trends go. Yes. And so, some of them obviously end up adding a lot of value. Like mobile as a trend added a lot of value to the world. And once it was like, oh, iPhone is out and mobile apps are the thing, like you'll see 90 out of 100 people in in the Bay Area, just working on mobile apps. And that kind of, uh, as, the, as they do that, they kind of just focus on making money in that thing or building products in that particular thing. And what I see is like, it's very limited uh, diversity of thinking from folks who are working on, you know, completely different angle. So in, in Bay Area, you would not see founders working and just making it up like something in fashion or retail or something like that. If you, I, I go to, I'm, I'm in, uh, I'm not in San Francisco uh, right now, but as I, I'm not living there right now, but as I go there, I talk to founders. It's all like, I, you cannot talk to anyone without talking about AI. That's, right. that's the only thing that's in everyone's like- mind. Right. Now, not all VCs are like mm-hmm. that, like sort of. Peter Thiel's is anti mm-hmm. consent, I would say. Mm-hmm. But I think in general, you're right. Most of VC is consensus around a theme. Right. And they're always selling the future. Right. And I always, I also think it's more true for the Bay Area than anywhere else. There's always a bubble of sorts. So we call this ZERP of 2021. Like it, I think it just expanded to all the categories, but there's always some hype that's being yeah. driven in the Bay Area. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. Like AI obviously is going to create a lot of value value in the world. Right now, the valuations are far ahead of that value. And in my humble opinion, I think value is understated and values are overstated in AI right now because value is just going to be created in the long run. Like this concept of American dynamism and bringing manufacturing back to the US, like someone worked on it, someone like worked on this concept and said, let's do more manufacturing in the US. And it's going to be super valuable in the long run. But now like people will just congregate around this theme and will just try to do a lot of stuff uh, for that particular theme. I agree. So what you're saying is like, there's always a bubble, yes. number one. Number two, that means valuation is high. Mm-hmm. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. 
We saw Cohere mm -hmm. a few weeks ago out of financing at a 200 plus ARR, mm -hmm. which is higher than the 100 times annual recurring revenue valuation that we saw in 2021. Yes. Now, one of the founders wrote the seminal paper, which I think will go down in the annals of human history called Attention is All You Need, which birthed the transformer model. But is that worth a 200 plus? I, I read the, I can read the paper, mm -hmm. you know, like maybe he'll find the next paper, not publish, I right. suppose, but, you know, it's a, uh, so you're seeing that in AI, I, right? I, you're seeing it across, up the with, yeah. across the board uh, and you're seeing indigestion from that, mm -hmm. right? We saw indigestion raise a ton of money at a billion plus valuation and had investors, including NVIDIA and Reid Hoffman and Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And they got bought for by Microsoft right. uh, and found a way to make investors whole. Right. I think now, by the way, Reed Hoffman is I think, on the board of Microsoft and investor. So I think that's how that deal got brokered. Yeah. <laughs> think about, talk about value added investor. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but Satin Adelaide also like has come out of like over the last 10 years, has just kind of built a, a fairly strong reputation around actually delivering on his promises when he bought LinkedIn, like that was a $26 billion acquisition, I think at the time. And LinkedIn is just a great acquisition too. A wonderful acquisition. Right. Like, so, so he's, he's just been like, he, I think he is of all the big tech CEOs, he is the one who is the, the, the most ahead in AI. He did open AI way before everyone did anyone did anything in API in, in AI. He gave them a billion dollars worth of Azure credits and whatnot. So he owns a lot of, as in like Microsoft owns a lot of IP in, you know, of the brightest minds in AI, not in big tech within companies, but the new IP that is being created by startups. Yeah, I'll challenge that in one way. I'll say Google has deeper roots and history in AI. Mm -hmm. The Transformer right. paper came out of Google seminal core founders of OpenAI sure. came out of Google uh, and Microsoft's playing catch up, but to their credit, they're catching up and they made these strategic bets and now they've internalized uh, inflection. Yeah. So yeah. they've got native expertise and they don't have to rely on a, an affiliate called OpenAI, which is a, funky relationship because yeah. they're both selling yeah. the same yeah. target. They're both selling like enterprise, yep. both trying to deliver value to the consumer. Mm -hmm. It's not a clean separation of roles and responsibility, just conflicts. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's why I said like uh, Satin has done like uh, buying IP that's outside of Microsoft in AI. I think Google has, if Google used its internal AI yes. to the, best of its ability, I think nobody else would stand a chance. Uh, but I think Google is just fighting its own internal culture and some problems there. Right, right. So what are the other observations you have as someone that's lived in multiple countries around uh, entrepreneurship? And are there differences that you saw from Germany? What about India? Like India, uh, the disposable income is growing rapidly. Sure. Right, sure. an engineer in India might not earn as much as an engineer in the U.S., mm -hmm. but their take-home pay oh, yeah. after cost of living is higher. Mm -hmm. So disposable income is going through the roof. Mm -hmm. India stock market all-time high. Mm -hmm. uh, H-1B visas to enable the United States to cherry-pick the best talent from India are flat. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why India stock market's going up. By the way, because the entrepreneur like we're going to go build. Yeah. Let's go yeah. build. Yeah. <laughs> so what's up with the India? Yeah, you know, entrepreneurship ecosystem. What's working and not working? Okay, so I, so I've be, not been in India like I've to in a while. I've not been to India in a while, and like I uh, I just only talk to friends who are there and try to you know understand their observations. Sure. Plus, I grew up uh, uh, for most of my life in India, so I'll just combine all of these three. So the the funny thing is, I actually started tried to start a company in two thousand and seven, even though when I didn't know what was like starting a company meant. I just wanted to start a business. And I was teaching kids in, in the US uh, a co uh, and getting paid by the no child left behind policy. So US in 2007, I think George W. Bush had no child left behind policy because schools, not enough students were graduating school. So they're like, government is gonna pay for their tutoring. So I was like teachers in India, but uh, teach math to US students. And I got one right. customer and made some money. So I went through a process of like, 
just um, registering for a business, like, you know, paying taxes and things like those. Oh, my God, it was brutal. Again, it's 2007, so things may What made it brutal to starting a business in India? You know, uh, I had to go to this like dinky little government office to submit my application. And when I submitted it, they did not take it. Then uh, they they were like, you know, we, we, we have to like um, buy food for our children. The government officials telling me like in, in certain terms, they have to buy, buy food for their uh, children and stuff, which essentially meant that I have to like give them some money. And I was like, you know. He wanted a kickback. He wanted a bribe. He wanted a bribe, yeah. To approve your application for company formation. That is correct, yes. The equivalent of registering on Delaware, which you can do online in eight minutes right. through legal yes. Zoom or some service. Right. So you have corruption. And was that a one-off instance or was that pervasive? It was like throughout my experience. And and I can also like relate it back to like, so my father ran a co- sort of convenience store in India and I worked with him uh uh, on that too like i would see like a lot of time it's just like it's like how much money is it going to cost me to deal with the government and there's always people who we paid to uh to pay the government because we couldn't directly pay them like it's a very complicated it's a cost of doing business. Yeah. corruption bribery it's a cost of doing business and, and that takes away from like the focus on Indian. the business itself and right. that was back in 2007. But like, uh, as so I, I moved moved out of India and I lived in all these different countries. But I still talked to some founders, friends who went back to India, and they had seen how easy, not how easy, but how like the process of fundraising in the U.S. And then like they saw the process of fundraising in India. And was very, which is what? What's the difference? It's just like they make you run around a lot. They they'll ask you for like a ton of information they won't respond to your calls they would um they're not professional investors. they would not treat you well uh is the sense i got from these folks now i'm not saying all investors are like that but that's the sense i got well they value their money more than the opportunity whereas if you're an american professional venture investor reputation matters right. and you might be looking at the fund return rate, right and you don't know that. yep uh, so you've got to be responsive, although, you know, American VCs can be assholes sure. too. There's a great book called Founders at Work. Mm-hmm. I recommend people reading. There's a great chapter about Hotmail hmm. in that book, which is a great exit. Yeah. I won't know the VC, but the stories about that entrepreneur to deal with the VCs are, are super telling. Great book, by the way. It's like 10, 10 to 14 page little case studies written by the founders, uh, their, their voices. So got it. So India has got a bunch of low level corruption. Yeah. And that makes it difficult for, uh, from from what it seems like, makes it very difficult to run the business. Co-founder, even though I haven't had like detailed conversations with my, um, with this person about like uh, building a company in India, but he was co-founder of Dunzo also. And uh, so this guy, I think because he had good investors, he had an easier route, but founders who did not have that, uh, they had a much harder route raising. They actually raised money from US VCs and not Indian VCs because US VCs still invested in their companies faster than Indian VCs did. You had this great observation when we had together. You said all the issues America has are at the macro, Mm -hmm. not the micro, and all the issues India has are the micro, not the macro. What did you mean by that? So um, in India, if if, if I'm living my life in the US, I don't have to worry about running water. I don't have to worry about like you know, getting my driver's license at the DMV and all of that stuff. Yes, there is process and bureaucracy and some annoyance there, but I don't have to be like, how much do I need to pay this person to get my driver's license? Or how much do I need to pay the government official to get my phone line or whatever it may be? And a lot of those things actually take, end up taking a lot of mental space for day-to-day living uh, in India. When I moved to the US, I just saw that the other side of it is like, I can just come have all these things on autopilot and only focus on the things that I want to focus on. And uh, those were like high value activities. So if I were running a company in India, half of my time would be just spent in dealing with all the little issues of everyday life uh, in India, be it corruption, be it traffic, be it just like getting, you know, physical labor to, uh, or like blue collar workers to do the work and stuff like that. Again, like I, because I also ran a convenience store, I, I was in that world for 12 years of my life before I moved to moved out of India. 
Uh, so I saw all these things fairly closely and I don't know how much it has changed uh, more recently because I haven't been back in the past five, six years. Uh, but that yeah. that kind of is like very tricky in India. And I also think the Indians, Indian consumer does not value convenience. It's very difficult to get Indian folks to- That's a good- To pay for- Say some more about that. That's a great point. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, I think I- read so the, the Let, Let's double click on that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was double clicking. Uh, so, so the thing that there is like, we would, uh, uh, and, and I have like understood it like from various angles, from my experience running a store and then from like other folks also is like, we used to sell, cause we were like a neighborhood convenience grocery store. It's like you go to Bodega in the US, right? Like you pay, you expect to pay a little higher price than Costco or something else. Um, or Walmart or whatever it may be. Like people would like start fighting with us saying that Walmart sells it for that price. And I want it at that price because Walmart sells it for, for a lower price. And, they're haggling with you. <laughs> and they'll haggle with us and they won't buy. They'll go to Walmart spending two hours driving to that particular thing or, you know, like spending their time to buy something for a lower price. And they are very financially conservative which also makes them great borrowers, by the way. So, so they will like, you know, save money and they'll pay you back. But it becomes very tricky to deal with them uh, as companies selling services. And again, this is like all uh, a little while ago. Well, I, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll elaborate there because my experience, you know, I, I grew up in the States. Uh, my parents from India originally, though. And, you know, I have cousins who I've gone to visit a few times. And, you know, in the U.S., it's sticker price, retail pricing. You don't go to the register and like negotiate on the way out when you're buying like your products that doesn't happen india that like there are stores i remember i bought a chess set mm -hmm. i love chess i was like all right i'm gonna get a nice chess set from india mm -hmm. like the cradle of chess right. and so i i go up and down eight stores and i try to find the best you have to do that because they look at you they size you up they're like all right this guy's american he's probably got money give him like five extra price by the way, I'd have to have my aunt, my aunt go in and like do the negotiation. Right. <laughs> after, but we can't go in at the same time; otherwise, I'll make that connection. Right. This is all friction. It's a different kind of cost. It's not low level corruption. It's a different kind of cost, though. It's friction, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then I, uh, you know, I bought the chess set, and then I, you know, a block later, I found another one. It was like half the price. I knew instantly I was screwed mm -hmm. by the other merchant, even after I'd done my work. And so that's why there's a culture in India of like, oh, you got to make sure you get a good deal mm -hmm. and just assume the person's trying to screw you in a transaction. Yeah. And so it's a it's a mess. It, um, yeah. The, the, the thing that people may not realize, like U.S. doesn't have retail prices for written on products like you can get a can of Coke, Walmart, like Costco for like, I don't know, 20 bucks for 30 cans or something like that. And you'll get a can of dollar here in um, at the at the local store in India, everything has a maximum sale price. And then you cannot sell the product at a price higher than that price. You can only sell it for a lower price. So if it's priced at 20 bucks, you can say 50% discount and I'll sell it to you for 10 bucks, but you cannot sell it for more than 20 bucks. In the US, there is no, there is nothing like that. Right. What about status culture? I would say that's a key difference between India and the United States. In India, so there are many, so um, like there are retail, there are like fast food chains, like or fast, uh, something like Starbucks, like a coffee chain. It's like a run of the mill state, you know, you buy your coffee at Starbucks. It's now it's expensive, but it's still, you know, your regular coffee chain. It's not artisanal. It's not expensive. Like all these things are pretty expensive in India. So if you're going to Starbucks, you're actually paying Three dollars for a coffee, which is a lot, or five dollars. Oh, three dollars for coffee in India is a lot. Yeah, so I'm going to pull up the GDP per capita here. Go ahead. I think it's like twenty grand. So, yeah, three dollars on a twenty grand. Yeah. is is so. Say some more about status and branding and Starbucks. What does that mean? Yeah, so that means people are willing to spend money on what aspirational things. So if Starbucks is aspirational, or even McDonald's is somewhat, somewhat aspirational, they'll spend money and make it an outing. The same way we may go to, you know, I don't know, Six Flags or something like that. Uh, people will spend money on that, but what they consider like a pretty, uh, you know, not high status thing, they will not want to spend money on that thing. And I, and I did the same. I went to Subway 
in 2008 because it, it launched in India in Subway. And I could not, it was so expensive. It was like $2 at the time for like a foot long. And my friend and I were like, okay, we'll take a six inch Subway and we'll divide it in half. So we contributed money because he just wanted to taste like what Subway, Subway is like. Right. So by the way, I got a Dunkin' Donuts here. It's a dollar seventy. Yeah. Espresso. Uh, I, I'm outperforming the uh, India consumer right. paying three dollars at Starbucks. Yeah. Um, you know, value is something that's just inside you. I guess. Yeah. Uh, but say some more about that. So in India, they want aspirational experiences, and they're willing to pay up for that. Yes. Because there's also aspirational products and brands like Louis Vuitton and the purse and Hermes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Help us just unpack those two. So there's aspiration for the middle class then aspiration for the rich. Right? So even a software engineer who's, who has now a lot of uh, uh, purchasing power, um, they, would, they may aspire to a Hermes or a Louis Vuitton or something like that. And they would like, that would be aspirational for them because now Starbucks is within reach because they are making 100,000 plus a year in income and they can go buy a Starbucks. They see their U.S. counterparts doing that and they just end up doing the same thing. And uh, yeah. for for the normal Indian middle class, which is like not see just non-software engineers working in India, making, let's say, $10,000 a year, $15,000 a year, something like that, uh, they would find Starbucks aspirational. And like, I think like, uh, younger generation would like take money from parents to go hang out with their friends at Starbucks. And then a family may go to a Starbucks or a McDonald's who's like, okay, this is our weekend outing. And that's, um, that's where they spend money and they'll try to haggle their way into from on everything else that they consider as a regular. non -operating. So at Starbucks are willing to pay sticker price. Yes. It's an American brand. There's no negotiation there. Mm -hmm they'll save money to have that experience mm -hmm. with their family mm -hmm. and saying, cool, we went to Starbucks. Like I remember when I, I think it was 10 years ago, I was in India and we went to Pizza Hut. Now pizza in the U S was in decline as a brand, mm -hmm. but maybe it was 12 or 15 years ago, but it was in the, it was in the distant past, let's say, but it was a hot spot. It was a cool spot. It was a place to be. Yeah. So I think yeah. I see what you're what you're describing that that phenomena um, uh, incredible. Let's talk about investing in your friends. So you had a roommate at Columbia that launched a billion dollar unicorn. Talk about a transition, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the so so it, it just so happened to be a coincidence that we were five roommates. Uh, okay. Four of us ended up starting companies, um, and one of them actually worked at a at an early stage. Uh, at an early stage company that eventually sold for half a billion to Cisco. So uh, me and my co-founder, Priyank, we were roommates at Columbia, so we started still. Another roommate ended up starting, uh, he was the co-founder CTO of a company called Dunzo in India. So he, he started that, and I think it went like close to a billion dollar valuation. I don't remember the exact number, between 800 and million and a billion. And he ended up starting that. And, and he was like, it, it, Talk about like vision. So he had he was a top five percent performer at Google. He used to make a shit ton of money here. He left that job. He went back to India and started doing startups. So he did a couple of small startups and then or small products that didn't become startups and then eventually started Dunzo as like real first uh, VC backed company and did fairly well there. Um, the the fourth roommate uh, actually started a couple of companies in computer vision. So you know all the things that we see with like um uh, images that that you can move them and stuff like that prior to open ai uh where you could change the background you can extract the image outline from the photo and stuff like that so he did a couple of products like they used to try to you know make them go viral didn't work out and ended up working in apple's vision team not the vision pro team just apple's vision team and now he's back at like some early stage startup and the last one worked at a, a startup called Epsilon, which sold to Cisco for half a billion. Kind of incredible. Yeah. So what well, you said, a group of, of five yeah, we initial five. Room, yep. and four of them had extraordinary outcomes, mm -hmm. billion to half a billion, extraordinary. And that was undergrad or was that? Masters. So, Columbia? so the, Columbia. yeah, Columbia. Nice. Yeah. So um, the funny thing is I was the only non-computer science because I studied operations research. And I became roommates with these four people because 
I could not find uh, an apartment and other roommates. So I was the, so generally it's, it happens that all pe people, uh, students going to a particular program, they end up becoming roommates. So operations okay. research folks were roommates with other operations research folks generally. And then right. I was the odd one out because uh, because of various reasons. And I can go into that if you want, but I, I, I could not find an apartment. I had these four roommates. You didn't know them from a hole in the wall. You just needed to get a place to sleep. And it turns out you stumbled onto uh, like Gen 2 Y Combinator, yeah. which apparently is going to Columbia and yeah. the computer program. And uh, that's extraordinary. What, what were some of the behaviors that you saw there or like the, you know, um, some of the observations that you saw from that incredible clustering of talent? So I think... Um, uh, one one big difference was the 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 uh, was taking risks amongst all of us. Like some people were willing to take more risks, some people were willing to take less risks. I actually tried to start projects with other folks who were computer science students. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that they were all a year ahead of me. So I so they had come to Columbia a year before I did. And then, so I was also roommates, not only with computer science folks, but people who were a year ahead of me. So I actually tried to start a bunch of projects with other students who were in the same year as I was and who were computer science or non-computer science. And I would have to like drag them by their fingernails to be like, okay, let's create, let's build a project. And like most folks were just like, they would spend a night on it and they're like, ah, we don't want to do it. And then they'll just, you know, uh, go their own merry way. And uh, so that was one interesting thing is like nobody wanted to build these side projects and, and take risks and, and do things. Uh, there were a few people who did uh, ended up doing that. So they, they were into startups uh, who were not. But that group, they were. They were focused and they were building. Yeah, they were building. In, in our group, like they, the, the, the common theme was they were all pretty excited about something. So my co-founder, Priyank, he was excited about large scale machine learning. And he went and worked at uh, uh, Live Labs, which actually became Bing Search. So he worked on large scale image machine learning and clustering of images at Microsoft for six years. And then he did machine learning at Amazon. So he, he was mm -hmm. really into machine learning. The, the co-founder Mukund, who became uh, co-founder of Dunzo, he was just a very you know high agency person. He would just uh, he was a problem solver. He would just try you. Go to a pro. You go to him with a problem, especially computer science, and he'll just try to solve it. And and uh, he's also not only like smart, but high agency. So that was another kind of thing. Um, the third roommate who did like computer vision stuff, he wanted to do interesting stuff in computer vision, but he and I were like too far in terms of like my knowledge of computer science and his expertise. Uh, so that didn't fit. And the last one uh, was. Uh, just basically into uh, you know developer tools kind of thing, and then he worked at Intel for a while, and then he quit his very stable, high-paying Intel job and said, "I'm just going to go work at a startup in New York because it's just all pretty boring." And then he took that risk. So risk taking, in they have passion, I'm passion mm -hmm. curiosity, risk taking, but they're also in a climate, namely each other, right. that probably encourage that. You know, there's expression. You are the five people you surround yourself with. It's just, I think, totally true. One hundred percent. Your mind, your habits, your attitude, your approach uh, to problem solving, your resiliency, your network. Uh, so uh, incredible, incredible. Uh, so, what would you say? You know, as, as an angel investor, mm -hmm. you know, how do you think about investing as it relates to you know investing in your friends? So the only thing that I've done is uh, just invest in people I know because I. I'd, at the end of the day, as I said, like, like one thing is very clear in my mind that it's all power law all the way through, right? And I, what ends up happening is meaning that a handful of outcomes drive the bulk of the returns. That is correct. Yes. So uh, maybe one company is going to be a fund returner, and the rest, all of them, will be duds or something like that. <clears throat> so uh, ten percent of the companies will be ninety percent of the outcomes. Um, and what I realized was like, if I'm trying to be in a company that's, uh, so th the first thing to to know is like, at, at the earliest stages, you'd never know which company is going to become big. If you could, like all YC founders will invest in all the other billion dollar YC companies. And it's almost impossible to tell uh, with a very high hit rate as in who's going to be successful. 
So that's mm -hmm. one. The second is, so you have to, if after someone is validated and becomes successful or like has proven that their company is going to work out, it become, you just cannot invest money in that company or you end up investing at a, such a high valuation that you actually don't get a return. So what my- right. Not accessible or the deal you can't access, you get adverse selection or you pay through the nose, which heats into your return. Right. All of those problems end up happening if you're too late or you, um, uh, you try to chase, you know, uh, something that's hot. So the only thing that I figured out was like, it only works if I work with the founders or I know the founders before they were hot, before their companies became hot. The only thing that I need to figure out is like, who amongst my friends uh, will I invest in if they started a company, even without knowing what they'll start? So, so you don't care what they're going to start? No. I, I just like, I, I'm just like, I'll just give you money. I'm, I'm investing in. What are you asking? then? I'm sorry? What do you ask them? You say, hey, your friend says, hey, Rohit, I'm going to start a business. Yeah. You say, what's your wire information? Like, what, yeah. what do you, how do you? Yeah, yeah I, I think there's this one company that told me, so I was working with the founders for a while and they were like, oh, we have decided the idea we are going to work on and we are doing friends and family round. And uh, 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 would you invest in our company? And if, if, if you are just like, let us know. So we... So I think I was the second check in the company because I just believed in the founders and like, I can invest this X amount. Would you take it? They're like, yes, we'll take it. And then within two hours, I actually just wired the money. I didn't even care about the valuation. I didn't care about uh, the details of the idea of the market. And You didn't care about the valuation. So I, I, I like the idea of investing in people you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's a story of who is it that was raising money from someone I knew for a long time and they were getting a bunch of questions about the analysis and they just said, hey, look, look, go ahead. I think it was you know, Keith story. who was doing Open Door, right. Keith Raboy, who was doing Open Door and he went- Your deal, part of the PayPal mafia. Yes. Guy, guy right. is like super accomplished. Right, and, incredibly accomplished. So go and ahead, yeah. and he's story. like, like who, like if Keith says invest in me, like you'd be a fool to not invest in him. And I think he started, was starting open door and he went to a VC and he's like, I'm going to do a series A, uh, like, you know, uh, would you like to invest? And the, and the, he had known that investor for, I don't know, 10 plus years or something like that. And the investor just asked, started asking a bunch of questions and Keith's like, no, no, the only two questions you need to ask is ask are how much and at what valuation, like, that's that's the that's the reason I'm coming to you. I'm not like going and raising a round in, in a marketplace. And then I think Glenn Solomon, who uh, who's from now Notable Capital, I think he ended up investing in Open Door Series A or Series B, and that company, I mean, became a very big exit. Right, it, Open Door's publicly traded. Yeah. I don't own it. I wouldn't want to own it, but great exit. Yeah, you know, great journey we went through. I like that. Look, if you. You have the underwrite at the seed stage. It's all about the founder because they are going to have to learn and pivot and iterate. Right. So what else you need? You you have more insight into that founder than anyone else. Right. Than the VC who's looking at a PowerPoint. Right. So um, uh, it's it's all very uh, I think just uh, people driven. And then what my thing is like if. Uh, I can obviously like build so to to be a good investor. I think I need to have like bigger network where I know people who I will just invest in, uh, and not with the with the intention of oh I'm trying to find people who I'll invest in. Just like if I build relationships with them and I'm confident in their ability, uh, I'll just invest. Like one one founder friend or who became a founder, he's like the best po programmer I know you know, high, very high agency person. And I told him this is back in 2015. No, not, yeah, 2014, 2015, when I was starting Stilt. And he's like, dude, how you can take it? How can you take a risk? He was also on a visa and stuff like that. And I told him, like, if you ever start a company, like eyes closed, I will invest uh, as soon as you register the company or whenever you want the money. He ended up starting a bootstrap company, unfortunately, so I couldn't invest in his uh, company. But uh, that's that's the perspective I have. And I mi I'll miss out on a lot of great deals, and that's fine. But um, investing in the network is actually very good, is financially better than trying to just... Well, you have to have a good network and be in the market. Yes. Right? If you live in St. Louis, Missouri... Right. Investing in whom you know, right. probably not going to work out for you. Right. 
if you're in New York or SF or maybe Austin, Texas or Miami, or you're in the right hub, it's not necessarily geographic. Yep. Right. If you are at Carnegie Mellon, which has one of the world's best computer vision programs, mm -hmm. and someone wants to go start a business there, and you know them, and you can underwrite their resilience, grit, learning, problem solving ability, leadership skills, you should probably go do that because you are in a good network. So to apply that strategy, you have to curate your network. I would say try to do good things, try to be good yourself, and the network will follow. Like nobody likes a, uh, to be like all the great people don't like to be associated with someone who's not great themselves, but just trying to be a part of, you know, a great network like that. I, I haven't seen ever work out. The first things in my mind, the first thing is try to be good yourselves. You start building a network, try to continue to build a network. You try to be good yourself, does that mean pay it forward or have accomplishment? Or have accomplishment, like be good at something yourselves. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You're exchanging value with your network, right? Yes. Because you learn from others, you know, it comes to deal flow too. Uh, you know, we are very careful about what family offices and investors we trade ideas with. Right. We know where we are net exporters. We know where we are net importers. Right. And the best deals get oversubscribed. There's not enough to go around. Yeah. So yeah. you don't want to broadcast them. You have to be very careful about cultivating that network and you get better flow the deeper your value added and expertise is in fact people will come find you yeah i think when I mean, people come find i'm sure like a lot of people reach out to you for advice and feedback and all that stuff and uh you may not remember but when i was going through my acquisition i had actually called you and you had spent across two calls more than two hours just guiding me through how to think about the process and and there was not at that time we never talked after that but that was like something super helpful to me took two hours of your time i don't know you were playing with your kids or something like that and you still took out that time uh to uh talk to me and and guide me and give me some high level um details of process and how I should think about it. That was super helpful in, uh, in little and big ways that actually ended up impacting the outcome of the company. Well, it's incredible. I mean, you've, you've, you've accomplished quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, where do you want to focus now? What's your journey ahead look like? What do you want to do when you grow up? So uh, I'm, I'm right now in that exploration phase of what I want to do next. But there are two things that are core uh, that bring that bring me joy one is like building companies and second is like helping founders so it's going to be at the intersection of that so one thing i'm right now doing is like building site projects with my co-founder who was also my co-founder at still so we are building some site projects and i always think of companies as site projects first company second so i'm doing that and the second thing i'm doing is i'm actually acquiring companies uh that have been on that vc treadmill and have that got that 200x valuation which is the busted top table company yeah. that making money no exit in sight valuations too high right so it's a walking zombie company yeah so what do you want to do you want to buy these companies and fix them what's the game plan buy these companies and turn them around and grow them at the pace they are supposed to grow not spend a lot of money trying to compress time and in, as I mentioned previously, like in many of these cases, VCs want their money out because they, there is opportunity cost of money and the founders are not going anywhere. So founders can focus on their next big thing while we take over the company and actually grow it organically or at a slower pace. So compressed time means don't be on the VC treadmill where you've got to ramp up revenue and throw a lot of money at the wall and see what sticks right. and a lot of fat you know, in the company, yep. you're going to take a disciplined approach because you and your co-founder are operators. Mm -hmm. And are you going to have a, a niche focus area? Uh, no, we are, we are pretty open. I think my, if I were to like, think about like my broad interest, my broad interest is building a company uh, rather than building a company in a certain sector. I obviously know FinTech fairly well. I know lending really well within FinTech, uh, so right. I take that angle, but there are companies that are um, that require a lot of uh, money to grow. Lending is one of those companies. Fintech actually in many areas, 
Right. Right. Like, and, and yeah. you know, through uh, Pure IQ, anyways, that it just requires insane amounts of money, and there is economies of scale. So, fint- there are no small fintech companies. There are either really big fintech companies, or there are no fintech companies. Uh, at least in many in many verticals. Uh, so it just depends on the type of company. And we are working on a couple of like these companies right now. As we close them, uh, we'll announce them and we'll try to, you know, make investors. Super cool. You're building a cedar fund, essentially. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's a special case of private equity where instead of having a private equity fund that makes investments, you want to own and operate a target company that meets some kind of criteria uh, and then clean it up, you know, reduce expenses, grow the revenues, tighten the marketing, tighten the operations and put it on a sustainable footing. Uh, Super interesting. Uh, Look, operating is hard. And if that's your competitive advantage and it is, why not apply that to generate value from that? For sure. Uh, And, uh, very, very cool. How, how can people stay in touch with you or learn more and, and follow you? Yeah, uh, I'm on Twitter most of the time now. So my Twitter is twitter.com slash Rohit dot. That's D-O-T-M-I-T-T-A-L. It's it's all spelled. Uh, I'm on and my uh, LinkedIn, I guess, will be shared. I'm on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash in slash Rohit dot Mittal. So I'm everywhere Rohit dot Mittal and dot is. Like there's only one Rohit dot Mittal. Yes. It seems like a popular <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it, it's the one that I uh, I decided is going to be my brand. Gotcha, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Rohit. This is a lot of fun. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for thanks for having me, uh, and thanks for all the advice and feedback that you had given me in the past. My my pleasure. Thanks, right. buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening in on the episode. Remember, in the world of investing, the road less traveled often leads to the greatest rewards. I'm Ram Alawalia, your host and Chief Investment Officer at Lumida Wealth, where we specialize in the craft of alternative investments. Invest wisely, stay ahead of the curve, and stay non-consensus.